I'm Spade Robinson, and this is Storyteller Therapy. So I am always excited to talk to you guys, but I am extra, 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 extra excited to talk to you today because we're going to talk about, I don't want to say it's my favorite subject, but I feel like it's what my colleagues and I, friends and I, clients and I talk about probably more than anything else as we're all making our way through this industry and having successes and failures and all of that. As you can tell by the title of this episode, it is all about rejection. What I'm going to be doing is a three-part series. Things come in threes. Good things come in threes. I've been doing three-part series for a while. This is going to be a three-part series about rejection in different versions of the industry. So this episode that you're listening to right now is going to be rejection when it comes to creative opportunities. So that is your labs and your screenwriting contest and things like that. Next episode is going to be making the most of rejection when it comes to jobs and roles. And then the last episode of the series is going to be about rejection when it comes to relationships in the industry. So relationships that you're trying to cultivate being rejected in that manner. It's all about mastering these different versions of rejection. Today we're going to talk about mastering the rejection from creative opportunities. We've sort of had our first round or first couple of rounds of rejection this year with the different labs and grants and other creative opportunities that are available to us, especially within the independent sphere. The next two episodes are going to be dealing with rejection more or less in the commercial for-profit sphere, but in the sort of artist support and non-profit sphere, there's a lot of letters going out this time of year. So today we're going to talk about how to master that and make the most of it. Okay, so I have a bleak film warning for the film that I'm using for our check-in. It's another film by Benny and Josh Softy, the brothers who wrote and directed a film I mentioned a couple of episodes ago called Good Time. This film is their directorial debut. It's a film called Heaven Knows What. I saw Good Time first and then I was curious about what else they had done. After I saw this film, I was just like, let me just, let me just go to sleep. The world is a dark place. It's a bleak movie, but it's one of the best recent versions I've seen of a character study in a long, long time. The main character, who's a heroin addict, is pushed to the brink of deciding which she loves more, heroin or her boyfriend. All this happens on the mean streets of New York. It's very, very raw, very, very indie, very dark, slice-of-life type of movie. But it studies the love life of this woman, in particular what's happening on the inside of her heart as it relates to this man and heroin in such a natural and compelling way that if you are currently writing a script that's a character study, especially about an internal conflict, I would suggest go see this movie. I watched it on Netflix. It's on Netflix right now. Find it, watch it, have a drink, and go to sleep. It's going to be okay. But I, I do think it will make you a better writer, so check it out. Now on to our session. I've structured today's session to sort of go from the worst news or the hardest news to swallow to the easiest news to swallow. So we're just going to jump right on in, okay? You may have already heard this before. Maybe I've definitely said it a lot before. Maybe you've taken it to heart. Maybe you've rejected the idea. And here's the thing. You and I are not going to tell any studio executives this. But first things first. As a screenwriter, a director, a producer, any creative above the line, rejection is by far the best tool you can get to make you better. I really believe that. I know from personal experience, but definitely from watching the careers of my friends and the careers of my clients. Bad material, mediocre material gets bought, sold, made, created, supported, cultivated, whatever. Whatever kind of support you're talking about. Mediocre and bad pictures or content get that all the time, every day. But that's not you, right? So let's just get that out of the way. Let's not worry about those people. They have nothing to do with us. That content has nothing to do with us. Especially in the event that you don't want that to be you, right? You don't want your content to be mediocre. You don't want your work to be just be okay. You don't want to be known as somebody who's made this bad to not terrible movie. In order to not be that person, rejection saves you from that and hopefully pushes you to make better work. So here's the deal. The impression that I get from a lot of filmmakers is that This is incredibly hard, and it is, that the powers that be or the gatekeepers have 
an ulterior motive that's not pure, which is debatable, whatever pure is. I mean, everybody has a mandate they have to go by, right? But at least from where I'm sitting as someone who consults with nonprofit organizations like Sundance and Film Independent and for-profit organizations or companies like Fox Studios or Adaptive Studios or whoever is taking in content from filmmakers. I used to say 80% of everything is bad, but it may be higher than that. And the pool of, especially the projects that I'm working on right now and the pool of what I'm looking at, 90% of everything is just not good. Like everything isn't God awful terrible, but most, by far, most of everything is just not great. It's like, hmm, like everything is hmm worthy. Oh, that's interesting. That's an interesting concept. But in terms of it being solid, structurally, narratively, the characters being fully developed, the concept being compelling, the quality of writing being good to superior, the sophistication, the notes of diversity and the nuance that everyone is looking for, and... In addition to that, an interesting artist. Those projects are really, 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 really hard to come by and very rare. So the harsh truth is the reason why you're not being accepted into these programs is yes, because it is very competitive. That is a fact. But like not really. It's only a little bit of a fact. And I and I think I've talked about this on the podcast before. Overwhelmingly, the reason is because there is still work to do on your whatever you're submitting. That's the challenging news. The good news is that it helps you to curate your work. I think one thing that people on the creative side and not on the curatory side really suffer from is the inability to curate what is good and what is not. Everything that they're making comes from the inside of them and therefore qualifies itself as significant. On the curatory side, we're looking at such a wealth of work that we formulate the ability, the language, and the very keen and sharp eye towards being able to curate not only what's good and what's not, but what's significant, what is timely, what is profound, what is striking, what is diverse, what is strong storytelling, what is a unique point of view, what is emerging, what is on the cusp of something, what is speaking to themes that are relevant, what is universal, what is specific, how does that matter, what is meaningful, what is highbrow, what is nuance, what is sophistication. We're all grappling with these things and asking ourselves and each other these questions about artists the more rejection you get the more you're able to temper and curate the work that you're creating and ask yourself these very questions the next thing rejection is able to do is it gives you time to build yourself as a person so that's something I talk about on this podcast a whole hell of a lot and that is that you as a person and you as an artist are inherently connected Who you are as an artist comes out of who you are as a person. The time that you would be at that lab or doing that thing or in that program or whatever, the fact that you were not accepted gives you that amount of time to, yes, cultivate your work a little bit more, but also cultivate what's going to make your work more sophisticated based on how you are becoming more sophisticated as a person. So there is an entire podcast about what to do before you quote unquote make it. And I suggest you go back and listen to it if you haven't listened to it. But the short of it is cultivate yourself as an individual who creates great work by way of your relationships, by way of your access to your own emotions, by way of your access to diversity and travel and exposing yourself to amazing work and the humility that surrounds the human experience. Essentially, now you have more time, the more you become a well-rounded, better read, better watched person, the better artist you're going to be. So take the time to do that. And then the last part of this section is that it allows you to see who and what is being curated or who and what is being chosen. So for all these programs, there's a press release that comes out that tells you who got into what program, as opposed to just scrolling through the press release to see if any of your friends got in or see if anybody you know got in or to look at it and scoff and say, oh, this person has already won 12 awards. That's where they got in. Really do research on those projects and those artists. What are the themes that are emerging out of those projects? What are some of the subject matters that are being grappled with and handled in these projects? And what is it that these artists have done? As opposed to complaining about the fact that these artists aren't necessarily emerging because they have done X, Y, and Z thing, think about 
from the curatory standpoint, what's competitive and what's not. The dial towards what is emerging has changed because the ability for people to create work is so much easier now, which means it goes back to what I said before. And now that you have this time, you can strategize about how to be competitive in these opportunities based on what you're seeing is being curated or chosen. The second thing to do is ask yourself, what is this program at its nature? What is this program designed to do? Not only will that help you better design your application when you're applying to these programs. I think something that I come across a lot when people are applying to a writing for episodic program and all they talk about is themselves as a director and their aspirations as a director and what they want to do in terms of directing feature films or they list a whole lot of their credits in animation when they are looking to work in live action. You want to be keen to support your own application and the area that you're looking to be accepted but also beyond that a lot of these programs are looking to help people at a certain place in their career they're looking to fill a gap right so reading the literature associated with the program and understanding what the program is at its core is going to help you feel a lot better about not being accepted if you can realize that every program is not for you a lot of artists do need help and support moving forward in their careers But you have to understand that just because a reputable company or organization is hosting something doesn't mean that that thing is suited for you going where you want to go. And I think the vagueness of people who want to work in this industry, who just generally want to work in this industry, but aren't able to clearly articulate what they want to do or don't have a clear strategy or plan to get them where they want to go and don't know how this program fits into that doesn't support them being successful in these processes. You being able to know what does this program do at its core? When I look at the breakdown of how the program works and oh, this program is specifically to introduce me to showrunners or this program is specifically to hone my craft in documentary. You have to know exactly what it is at its nature and then how that fits into your plan and even better when that fits into your plan. Not only is every program not for you, every program is not suited for you or you're not suited for every program where you are right now. It really helps you to master rejection when you have an idea of how you fit into the zeitgeist of how these programs work and flip it and really negotiate how these programs fit into the zeitgeist of your plan and or strategy. So hey, you would have to have a plan and or strategy, which is something we talk about a lot on this podcast but also I know and sometimes it can be really difficult to understand and feel when you're dealing with rejection but I want to be very clear that if you can really objectively understand the difference between these opportunities and how they are created and designed with intention to help artists at certain places and understand what they're looking for and why then I think you will be more discriminatory in terms of what you apply to and why And you will be able to navigate the rejection associated with not getting into certain programs and why. The third thing is preparation. The beginning of preparation is understanding where you're trying to go in your career and deciding or designing your strategy for getting there. And then understanding what programs or fellowships or grants or whatever is going to propel you into that place or help propel you into that place. And based off of that and knowing what these programs are at their nature and understand, okay, this these three, these four, this one program will prepare me where I'm going to go, then go look at their proposal checklist or their qualifications and make sure you can ace that application. So for a lot of these, you have to submit materials, right? You have to submit your script or your short or two letters of recommendation or whatever. And so because we want the opportunity, we apply with the materials we have at hand, as opposed to taking a year and cultivating all the materials I need or the relationships I need to master that application. Let's say if I want to get into a directing program, a shadowing program, and there has to be two letters of recommendation and a short film letter of interest that I 
way. As opposed to taking a short film that I made seven years ago and calling my boss from three years ago and then getting the pastor of my church to write a letter of recommendation and then applying with that and then writing a cover letter about how passionate I am about directing and then being disappointed when I don't get in what may be a better use of my time and money for that application fee is spending an entire year making sure that everything that I have to go into that application is supreme. So as opposed to applying this year, I might put all of my energy into making a stellar short film that represents what I can do right now, that represents the height of what I can do right now. It puts even the possibility of getting into the program a year out. But remember what we're talking about, we're talking about preparing yourself for the future. So even if you do not get into the program that you want to get into a year out, you are so much better prepared for where you want to go because now you have a short film that represents what you can do right now. The goal is not getting into the program. The goal is you getting where you want to go. And the program is a stepping stone but even if you don't get into the program you're a lot better off than if you would have applied this year and used some short film from 20 years ago not as much time and thought goes into these applications we just sort of see there's a deadline coming and it's like oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh I need this letter of recommendation as opposed to being like you know what I'm going to need two letters of recommendation about a year from now so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cultivate two relationships within the television sphere that I know that I'm going to need and keep up with those relationships so that at the bottom of this year I can ask for that letter of recommendation or this time next year I can ask for those letter of recommendations and they are going to be far beyond any letter of recommendation that I can get right now because I don't even have those relationships in my life, but I'm going to spend a year trying to get them. In addition to that, I'm going to spend the first part of this year fundraising for the short film I'm going to shoot at the bottom of the year that is far superior to anything I've ever made. In addition to that, I'm going to have an experience this year that is really going to help elevate my cover letter because of the internship that I'm going to take a pay cut to do or because of the friend that I know that I've been saying, let me help you in your film, let me help you in your film, and it's finally going to let me help them on my film. The energy, the time, the investment that it goes to preparing for these applications make a significant difference because of the competitive nature of these programs and because it looks like for my perspective a huge amount of people just apply with what they have as opposed to applying with the very best representation of what they can do right now so if it does take you a year a year and a half to prepare and this program really can propel you and if you don't get to the program whatever you create in that year and a half and an attempt to get in the program can propel you forward that is a worthy thing to do do not fall into the temptation of being in a hurry and comparing yourself to other people this is your life this is your career career and if you are going to master the rejection of not getting into programs then you are going to have to put yourself in the top five percent of people who are applying so that when if you are rejected there's so many more opportunities that you are well suited for because you have the materials you need fourth And last way to master the rejection for creative opportunities is to duplicate or replicate the lab or fellowship process. So let's say I don't get into the labs that I wanted to get into. I don't get into the fellowship that I want to get into. I don't get the shadowing program that I wanted to get. What I can do is research heavily and understand how that program works and then duplicate it for my life. So let's say there's a screenwriting workshop that I want to get into that I did not get into and I paid my little $35 and I got rejected and I submitted the best screenplay that I could have submitted. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna Google the weeks of that program or Google break down that program and what it looks like and say, okay, this is how this works because I looked it up. It happens at nighttime. It lasts for four weeks, seven o'clock, once a week. They watch a feature film and then they talk about the film. And then that weekend, they have a screenwriting session where everybody has to read everybody else's scripts. And then there's a guest speaker that's an executive. Guess what I'm going to do? If I need this program to prepare my career and I'm not getting into this program or I didn't get into this program, I've been trying for three years and I know my work is stellar and I'm still not getting into these programs, I'm going to duplicate that program in my life which means whatever stellar films they're watching that are at the top of the game I'm also watching those films whatever conversations that need to be had I'm going to gather people that I know in my living room smart people who are also artists and we're also having a conversation and then I'm going to do my best to set up meetings with or get information from executives so what happens is in a lot of these programs you're introduced to people but when they do talks or they do lectures a lot of that information that they're going to give to young minds 
students like yourself or emerging filmmakers like yourself is Googleable, which means that person also sat on a panel that you can Google. That person also did a talk that you can follow. That person also has a Twitter and they talk about how to get young screenwriters where they want to go that you can follow. That person also wrote an article for Shadow and Act or Indie Film Plus or whatever websites that you follow. There is not a lack of information. Programs don't reinvent the wheel or create something out of nothing. What programs do that's brilliant is bring really smart people together in a space where they have time to stop and think about their work. And then they bring other really smart people who are at the top of their game and teach them something. That's not difficult. What you have to do is curate or cultivate that time yourself to stop and pause and concentrate on your work. Surround yourself by other like-minded smart people. And also seek out that very information that's going to be within that lecture at that lab. I know it's an extra work on your end, but I think you'll be surprised at how well you'd be able to duplicate a program, especially if you got together with other people who are in the same scenario as you are. The key is to take the ingenuity, the research, and the curatory mind that we were talking about earlier to create a situation for you to grow and learn as much as people are within these programs. So those are my steps for mastering rejection and creative opportunities. If you have any questions about any of those, you can always hit me up. I will have the link to how to get in touch with me in my show notes. That is all that I have for this week. I will see you guys next week.